So I see some smiles here. So I know it, you know what that means. You know what that bill is. Well, I had no idea. And I drove my 50 Dodge and my dog up that hill. And I got up to the top. And I'm going, what is this place? I was blown away. I didn't know where to park. I finally figured out where to park. I didn't know where to go. There's, uh, there's just buildings everywhere. And so I go, where, where, where did I go? And I see this play sign that's, that's on a pine tree. And it says, Pack the Potter. And boy, did, I did not know what that meant for me at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I walked down that path, and I could hear classical music, and I could hear the rat tat tat of a potter's wheel, and I, there was a bench in front of the wheel, and I sat at that bench, and I watched this potter. So that was the first shape he taught me. 
and when he would, he was throwing one form after another, and I was watching him, and I said to myself, I want to be a potter. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be you. Can I learn how to, how to do what you can do? And uh, he asked me who I was, and I told him who I was, and that I had absolutely no background. I had one class as an undergraduate, it was all hand building. And, uh, and he says, well, you don't know enough. He says, you've got to come in here, you have to know how to wedge clay, you have to know how to throw, you have to know how to mix glazes, you have to know how to I said, okay. So I left there, him not knowing, and he totally changed the trajectory of my life. He had no clue. I walked out of there, all of a sudden, I knew who I was. I had direction, I had purpose. It was, it was once you got that, you got it all, you know? <laughs> so I, I, uh, I had been offered a graduate assistantship from school in art education, and so I went back down to the University of Florida, and I took every part of the class. And, and uh, when, uh, and I met Linda down there, although she's from up here. And, uh, uh, and I told her, this is, what, this is my dream, was to come back here and practice with Harry Hall and be a potter. And she was on board. She was saying, okay. Well, that was, that was the link I needed, was Linda. <laughs> I know that, right? I know that. I mean, I had never really been able to connect A with B. But with Linda, I could get to B. <laughs> she totally completes me. And, uh, and uh, in fact, we ran a nursery school down there. Uh, we started a school. We were, we, I found out how to be an entrepreneur, which is very critical to being a part of. As you don't work for somebody else, you got to work for yourself. You got to figure out who you are and what you want to be doing. <laughs> no, nobody comes around and tells you, <laughs> and it's great. <laughs> and uh, so I came back up after two years, got my master's, and uh, and thankfully I had Linda with me. I think that was critical. So we, I went to the studio, it was in uh, September, and I said, here I am, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> he had no idea who I was. <laughs> so I said, I have told him the story. I think he felt a certain obligation at that point. <laughs> and I think he looked at Linda, he says, well, this guy's with her, so he probably has some value somewhere. <laughs> Had something to offer. So I, uh, he let me mix clay for him. It was a it was a barter. I would do a work day's work for him mixing clay, and then he would give me instruction, and I would work using his facility. I would work on the roof, and I got to work sitting right next to him. Yeah, all in, in the off season. All winter, just me and him sometimes. I didn't know how lucky I was uh, in the beginning, but I was starting to figure it out pretty soon. That uh, I had, I did not really know how to be an artist. Being an artist was sort of something on that other side of the door. I hadn't walked through that door. Well, when I walked through. Harry's studio and work with him every day. I found I was in, I became an artist. It was all there. All I had to do was uh, pay attention. Uh, uh, I, he, I learned how he ordered his world. What was his priorities? Uh, and, and, um, and, and what an art, being an artist meant. And boy, the first thing I learned was that it's tremendously hard work. You have to be a willing worker to be a potter. You have to like physical work. This is physical work. But it's tremendously rewarding. 
to do physical work, especially when you're making things. There's nothing better than that. And it's something that's, uh, it, every day I get so rewarded that I get to sit in a potter's wheel and that I get to be, to do this. And I feel a certain obligation that I have to give it my greatest effort because I have to carry on this legacy in a sense. Uh, that, you know, it's that legacy right there. I feel I'm totally aligned in it right now. It's kind of crazy, actually. <laughs> 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 I, got, you know, I got the rooster back there and the model up here. And, boom, you know? <laughs> and then these glorious pots all around me. Uh, <laughs> how did I land here? You know? <laughs> but, it, yeah, I feel uh, incredibly blessed to, to be with the play and that I was given this, this life. And it was great working next to him because he was, he, he was a philosopher, you know, way, way beyond being a potter. He had everything, he had a way of life um, that he was professing at the same time that you were learning about. Um, that it, it's, and you really start analyzing your life, and, you know, okay, well, what's important, what's not important? You know, and I was learning from him. Uh, some, some things I didn't learn from him. I was better off that. I was, I was learning from Lyndon instead. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, in terms of how being, how being a human being is so critical. I mean, he had really come out of that crucible of war. And I've always loved history. I was sitting next to someone who, was, who had lived like at the, at the spearhead of history, over and over again. It was incredible to hear his story. I couldn't believe that I was sitting next to a person that, well, for one, he was a, a, a gunner on a, on a B-17, the Flying Fortress, out, out, of, uh, out of England. They fly over Germany and drop bombs. And uh, he would tell me stories about that. He said that, um, uh, he was flying, and he got flak. He said the flak was one of the worst things. And, uh, and then I guess it's from the anti-aircraft um, uh, guns that um, they would explode. And he got blinded by it. And so he didn't go out uh, in his plane, you know, because he was blind. He can't really be shooting. So um, he said his plane went down. That plane went down. His plane was down. He was not just because of the flak. I, I said, Harry, the reason why that plane went down is because you weren't on it. And he had had funny stories, too, uh, about World War II. I remember he told me a story about how um, they were loading these bombs underneath, you know, into the plane, and it was night. They had to do it before dusk, and they had a gasoline uh, generated there to give them light while they're lying. And you call, they call these things blockbusters. They could blow up the whole city block. And they were loading them up into the plane. He had his buddy up above to catch the bomb, you know, to, or to secure the bomb up, up inside the plane. And the, uh, and, a, and the generator ran out of gas. So he tried lighting the match. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, everything caught on fire. So he started running, and he's running, and he's going, oh, my buddy's in the plane. And he hits a post, and he falls down, and he realizes that the post that he ran into had the fire extinguisher on <laughs> <laughs> And so he got the fire extinguisher, went back, and put the fire out. And I, was, uh, I looked at him and said, Harry, I sure bless you got the fire extinguisher. Because <laughs> I'm here now, you know, getting getting this knowledge, but uh, you say he wouldn't have been able to run far enough away from that, that bomb. So it was uh, so many situations like that that you would tell of the war that was such a close call. Because those men didn't have the privilege of, of uh, living life, he felt he had to live life for them. So he really came back with meaning. I think that's so much what's missing now. He came back with meaning. He, 
for something larger than yourself. It's, you know, that's one of the lessons I learned. You know, you have to live, when you're living life, you should, you should be for you, it should be something larger than yourself. And that's what he was doing. He was always passing his knowledge on. And, there used to, and he had no secret. Why would you have a secret if you had that inner belief? And so it was, um, those lessons are so integrated into who, who I am. And it, it's, it was always wonderful having my son work in my studio. Uh, uh, he worked in, he's worked in my studio for 14 years after graduating from college. And be able to transfer these stories, these hairy stories, to my son. And then I'll hear him telling someone else. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's a beautiful moment. <laughs> I mean, life doesn't get better than that, right? I mean, that was it right there.
goosebumps for what is that story mean? <laughs> Um, porcelain yields to water very quickly, uh, and so you have to work quickly, which I'm not quickly, and, uh, or it collapses. And you have to work with as few movements as possible. I love this question, because now it's really, I'm talking about something that's very important. That's the thing that he learned from Amada, was that you make a piece with as few poles as possible. Uh, and that, and he would do, and that the piece has integrity if you do that. If you fuss with the piece, if you overwork the piece, a trained eye, a potter's eye, will look at that and go, "That's been fussed over." And as soon as you know that, you walk away. <laughs> that piece has, does not have integrity to you. And I can remember him spending time extra trimming and extra this, extra that. No, put it back in the clay bucket. Start again, throw that piece with as few poles as possible. And of course, the makes you do that. So it's great that way. And uh, yeah, that was a great teaching me that eye, how to look at pots for that eye. It's a great, great. I've seen pots that were $40,000 that were fussed over. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, say stoneware? Yes. There is a mountain in China that is pure porcelain. That's why they invented porcelain. They didn't invent porcelain. They found porcelain, and then they invented the, tech, the, the technology of a kiln in order to realize its full potential. Porcelain is translucent uh, when fired and made extremely thin. Uh, it's a pure white clay. It's made from one source. That mountain created that clay. Uh, Snowware is uh, can be brought from a thousand miles away. Uh, it's it's from the erosion. It's a breakdown of, of uh, minerals, uh, mainly uh, like feldspar. Uh, feldspar over eons of time, those it releases the alumina and silica uh, crystals. And the, the crystals are actually flat platelets, and that's why clay works. It's like, uh, if this was a hexagonal platelet, it would be the shape of a clay platelet. You can't see one single particle of clay. And but you can see a single particle of sand. Sand is huge, and sand does not hold its shape. So with, uh, you have this flat plate, platelet shape, and you put water between it, and you put them together, and they hold that they stay, they stick together, they don't move. That's what I'm doing right here, actually. I'm aligning these flat plate um, platelets. So that's what's happening at this moment. Microscopic. I'm aligning clay, and that's why clay works. Uh, porcelain is made of one source, stone is made of uh, a lot of different sources. It has a lot, a lot of what they call impurities, like iron. Uh, a car is well in pure. It's pure, it's pure it's give you wonderful effects. Porcelain, porcelain uh, uh, retains its whiteness. I'm going to make a picture. And when you're making a picture, you want to have a nice wide base. Um, and why would you want to have a wide base? So it sits. I love that. Oh, that's right. You don't want, to, you want something that's tippy with, with a lot of water in it. So I'm, uh, one thing you learn as a potter is you really focus on the silhouette of the piece. You really, it's, you get right down and you really look. So I uh, don't run out of, uh, I can't get my big hands, I can't get them inside there, just going to use this tool called the throwing stick. And uh, I'm going to pull that shape out, get a nice, nice spherical shape. And so this is the S curve. I'm doing a nice S curve. Can you see it? 
and you expect this is you uh, and Harry told you this you ex, uh, expand the rim. Sorry, I'm good. One two minutes off. Uh, the uh, You expand this nose to where it looks like it's platoon and it's too big, the rim, and then it's just right. And then you compress the rim. You always compress the rim. I remember I said, I said, so what are you doing there? He says, I'm pressing the rim. And I said, oh, I didn't know you did that. He says, he says, you didn't know I compressed the rim. He says, that's critical. If you don't compress the rim, the piece will split easily. It'll chip easily. You compress that rim, you line those clay particles, and you create a little bead of extra clay there, you have a much stronger piece. And you, if a piece has integrity, and people use it every day, uh, they'll gain great enjoyment from it. If it breaks and chips easily, it, 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 it's gone. And, it, and, and the whole thing is that you hope people live with these pieces every day and gain great enjoyment from it. So uh, the pieces having that integrity is really, uh, is really important. So now I'm going to make uh, a spell. And what I do is uh, I, I take uh, my middle finger and I take uh, my left hand and I take my two fingers of my right hand and I use this as my guide and I fold the clay upwards. So I'm going to create the, the, that double fold right now. Right there, there it is. <laughs> and, then I, and then you pull, you pull. And that pull, that's what makes it pour well. That little pouring I'm doing, that little pulling I'm doing, and then I, then I straighten it up. I look, I turn it up around and I straighten it up. And this shape is great because it keeps the ice inside. <laughs> <laughs> and when you put it now, the placement of the handles, and you see where I, when I pull that in, this doesn't look oversized, does it? Yeah, it makes it, it really brings it in. And then uh, what I apply the handle is right here on the rim, and then I attach it at the back part of the belly. And, uh, you know, I'll say this before. Uh, I think I was going to do some brush work. And, uh, I think I'll do this like that. I'll put this board up there now and just put it up there. Well, I have a cut out there. <laughs> that would have been hard to do. <laughs> Any more questions? I'd love to ask. That was a beauty. You sent your body doorway there. Is that I was going to make the most brown spots? Yeah, and Harry told me the history of that. That's, uh, Black Sand from Nassau Beach. Uh, he was in Oregon and they, they had black sand there. And they discovered, discovered when they put it in clay, it made these beautiful uh, uh, brown speckles. And uh, so when he came here, uh, his friend, uh, I think his name was uh, Roger Chamberlain. He did stained glass out of the in New Orleans. And uh, he worked with this black sand that he found at Nassau Beach. And Harry said, oh, we have black sand here? And so he started uh, mixing it into his clay. So that's what that is. So that's, that's a little bit of Cape Cod real estate right there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, that sand is very special because uh, it, uh, it has garnered it. And when you walk the beach, the outer beach, after a big storm, the, uh, uh, the whole beach in some areas would be this, this brilliant reddish purple. Have you ever seen that? It's in the bay. It's on the bay, too. It's all Cape Cod. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you can see it on the bay. Yeah, well, that's what we're, that's what we're collecting. Yeah. We go, oh, there's some of our sand. We, go, we, don't, we don't take much. <laughs> We're not taking dog What are your favorite forms to throw? Uh, wow. Let's see. I guess what I'm making at that moment. Yeah. <laughs> and you can close your eyes and do something, right? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it right now. You're talking and you're Yeah. Well, that's a, that brings
brings up a beautiful Harry story. Uh, Harry's always loved to demonstrate in front of children. And, uh, uh, and then, oh, but this, actually, I got to backtrack beyond that, before that. Uh, years ago, he said that a, a woman came in and said that her husband was severely depressed, that he had just become blind. And, uh, but he thought that maybe uh, he would enjoy clay, and would it be possible for him to learn how to throw in a potter's wheel? Mm -hmm. And so Harry took it on. He thought, I will learn a lot from this. He loved, he loved when he was uh, given uh, an exercise like that. So what Harry did is he blindfolded himself and threw on a wheel. And he said it improved his throwing tremendously. And, uh, and so that, that's, and, and this gentleman learned how to throw. And it was, and he had a much better outlook after that. It was, it was good, uh, so it's a very positive thing that he done with that, that gentleman. Okay, I'll have to not look. <laughs> See how we do.
would stop doing figurative work. That was Harry. I had to stop doing figurative And uh, one of the great, uh, big, well, for me, nature was always my source, was my muse. I love nature. And that's why I love the cake. You know, I love the nature here. Uh, it's, so, it's so amazing. It's so, well, so amazingly rich. And, uh, and so I, I made this exploration of nature. And I'm, what I'm doing tonight is brushwork. Uh, and uh, I'm going to throw a few pieces and uh, do some painting. And I'll do some of my nature themes. And he would do this beautiful brushwork uh, all the time. And he liked to have things in front of him. I remember one time he was putting corn down uh, on the ground right in front of his wheel. And he had it open there. And he would uh, uh, paint the uh, morning doves that would come around. Uh, he would throw a bunch of bowls and just be painting morning doves. For that day, you know, I don't know, all the different poses that were going out in this morning day. Um, so, um, so, you talk about when Harry had to go to the blackboard? Oh, well, yeah. That was, yeah, that's how he ordered his day. He started his day at, at the uh, chalkboard. And uh, he would draw on there what he was going to be making that day. And he would, if he had new ideas, he would work them out on the chalkboard. He said it's so much easier to work things out with a drawing than it is with the clay. And so that was a great uh, lesson for me. I, I don't work with a chalkboard uh, at this point. I work with uh, pad and paper you now. But um, it's just we, our space is so limited. We just don't have the space for a chalkboard. But it, um, also, he used to, uh, one of the Best, the most important lessons I learned from him was uh, I was making the same goofy uh, base shape. I couldn't come up with another base shape. I didn't seem to have the imagination for it. What is another shape? And I, I just make the same stupid shape. And uh, uh, he says, well, he says, there's three basic shapes that you make out of potter's wheel. And he drew one, he says, what's that? I said, that's a sphere. And he drew another one, and I said, that's a cylinder. And then he drew the comb. And those are the three basic shapes. Now what I want you to do is, is draw 50 different shapes utilizing those three basic shapes. You can use one, you can use two, you can use all three. I thought all of a sudden I had a repertoire of shapes I couldn't believe. <laughs> it was a wonderful lesson. Maybe I'll do one of those shapes now. So this one is, is uh, kind of conical, but then there's a sphere towards the top. And then I bring it in, and bring it up, and bring it out again. And there's the cone again. So that's kind of the, there's three shapes there. Well, it's two cones and one sphere. So that's how I began analyzing. And it, it, uh, it solved that problem. I, I had ever up twice of base shapes I could make over and over again. Thumb and you just round the edge there, and then you go pop, uh, center a little bit, and then it 
would sit nicely. And that would be it. That would be the piece. So you can hold them by that too, right? father-in-law did so many sculptural uh, figures himself and also did clay. His father-in-law. Father-in-law, right. Yeah, right. What was, their, what was their relationship like? Did they have a, a, a close relationship? Yeah, I think uh, Harry was very important to, uh, to Arnold. I know that when I was apprenticing, uh, Arnold, Arnold was working with clay. He was making work. That, that work. He was making those. That's, that's clay. He made those. That was fired in his garden. Uh, so he was doing that. Yeah, and of course, you have somebody working in your space. They're influencing you. They're, they're filling you with their knowledge. And, and uh, so, it, yeah, it was, so, it was wonderful to have, have an arm from. And I, can, I, I, uh, I don't think Harry thought much of me. When I was uh, prancing with him, uh, I, I wasn't showing much discipline in the beginning. Uh, he did like the fact that I used to come with like a big brown, uh, like uh, you know, big brown shopping bag full of food for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> that was hilarious. We used to always eat at his, his big house there, and you know, he would be laughing while I'm pulling out you know, like like a whole loaf of bread. <laughs> And, uh, but, uh, uh, he wasn't that, I it, it was a rocky start. And, uh, but, uh, I saw he was doing these architectural pieces, these castles. And I, I, and I went and saw this at the, uh, Weldon Library. I was living in West Barnes, or no, I, I went, went to this movie in West Barnes at the library. And it was the old, much back in Notre Dame, you know, with, with Charles Watt. So fascinated by that cathedral, and so I, I, uh, I, uh, I said, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to make Notre Dame. <laughs> and so, so I, yeah, so I came in the shop. And I'm telling Harry, I want to make Notre Dame. <laughs> and he's like, Okay, you know, <laughs> let's go for it. You know. So I made Notre Dame. I was there, and and he. I think he thought, you know what, maybe there's something here, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll make that investment in this person, yeah. Uh, but Arnold, I can remember Arnold, who uh, studied in Paris uh, back in the 20s. I mean, it was just amazing, his background. He, his, his best friend was Jacques Amé. Uh, and, so, and he had his little gray on, and he was walking around the, the Notre Dame, uh, and I could just see that he was almost being transported back to back, uh, Paris. And it, was a, it was a wonderful moment. It was a bird for you. <laughs> Cardinals. Yeah, it was made especially for Cardinals. <laughs> Blue 
Blue Jays moved in anyway. <laughs>
to have someone in your space that, have, that you love their mind, um, you love their eye, and, um, uh, and then to share. To every day be able to share your craft with them. I, I couldn't believe that the light was that generous for him. Uh, and, and he's a potter. He's a damn good potter. Uh, and I, it's something he will always have. He's been teaching uh, for two years now at Marshall High School. He's the head of the art department there. And it's a really big job. And he feels totally overwhelmed and, and, um, and, and wondering you know, what will these people think of when they hire me. <laughs> uh, but, um, but he's really into the mission. He says if you do this job well, it really has a, a positive effect on a lot of people. So I, I, yeah, we're, we're very proud of our children. Our, our daughter works uh, with children with autism, and uh, she works uh, in Brookline and works with the, the preschoolers. They're doing a lot of really intervention with them, and uh, uh, so she's doing really important work. And when she was in Rome, she took a drawing class, and she's doing these gorgeous drawings. And, uh, and she was sort of an apprentice saying, you can do that. And she's like, what? This is nothing. <laughs>
Uh, and what I just wanted to talk about this monolith here, I just thought it'd be fun. It's, it's wonderful for metaphor, these, these, these patterns. I mean, they really represent one time. This is really funny. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, in a sense, it's like our lives are like that. You know, we're, we're here for one time, <laughs> and then we're the bits of race, you know, and it's redrawn. And, and so, they have that quality to them. Uh, uh, but I made them permanent. <laughs> and um, uh, this piece, what I was wanting to, to, uh, to say here was I wanted to create a wall of these patterns. And, and, this, uh, and this wall represents the, uh, the patterns in the sand. And then I have a window. And this window, you can see the same ripple patterns on the surface of the water when you have a gentle wind. Uh, and so that's what this window is for. This slot brings your eye upward. And there you can see the ripple patterns in the clouds. That's why I had this photograph. So in a sense, this is a directional piece. It's sort of like um, the monoliths at Stonehenge. They're directional. That's capturing the summer solstice. This is a directional piece. This is, this is presenting our eyes on the three stages of ripple that we can have right at Cape Cod Bay. We can be on Cape Cod Bay standing on these ripples, and then we are surrounded by ripples. We have ripples in the water, and then we have ripples in the sky. I've been there when that's happened. And I glorify I that I've come to a point in life where I've actually realized that. It's like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I never really noticed ripples in the clouds until I started working through the ripples here. So it's wonderful, as an artist, you, you start down this journey and uh, all of a sudden it opens up and there's all this connection, tremendous connection. Everything's connected. Uh, these ripples are connected to a lot. It was neat to learn about the tides. I, I decided I gotta learn more about the tides. I mean, I knew the tides were created by the moon, but I didn't really know that's all I know. I, 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 I found out that, uh, I mean, why the two high tides in a day. Why are there six tides in a day? Or four tides, I'm sorry. Four tides in a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it was neat to learn that, that the moon and the sun, uh, to a degree as well, but the moon's very localized, it pulls on the ocean water and it creates a bulge in the ocean. And then the earth rotates under that bulge of water. So, we are, that, that, the high tide is not a wave of water coming to us. The earth is rotating to it. And so when that tide comes, you know, then we create that, we've had that alignment with the moon. And it's, a, it's like, so when you walk out there, you feel a little dizzy thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I just love how, you know, working with the theme, we'll do that. And this, my, my latest passion has been the uh, wood firing. And this piece right here is a wood fire piece where I've taken those, uh, those ripples and I've created a bowl. Uh, it's a very, it's, it's not, it's, technically it's not that difficult. I just work the clay at the right stage. And I put towels around it and get it to start being a bowl shape. And then I, I put a foot underneath it. You know, I, I, I create a, a foot and I attach it. But this right here is wood fire. And wood actually is a neat source for firing. The wood ash itself at high temperatures, what you're trying to do is blanket all the pots with wood ash. And then when you reach high temperatures, the wood ash melts and becomes a glaze. So the colors you're seeing on here are from the wood. Uh, and you can find it, you can see the direction of the wood. You can see which way, how is this piece facing when the flame is coming through. You can read the piece. 
And so it was really, and uh, what I, there was a piece on top of this. And so I laid down a bed of scallop shells and then put a piece on top of that, another piece on top of that. And those are scallop shells uh, that were in it, that left that impression. And, uh, and so you're connecting with the sea in two ways on this piece. It's connecting with the waves and then also with the shells. And I think it's great. Anytime you can connect with the beach. See, can you show us the bottom again? Yeah, you can see where there was, uh, you put these little wads of clay in there. So I think the bottom is beautiful. I think it looks like a tree with a, where an owl lives. <laughs> that we know that the minute that clay starts drying, that it will never be nice, there will never be a better pot. Uh, when the clay is wet, it just has a glow. It's a lot at that point. It feels like it's a lot. And when it dries, it's gone dead. Uh, but you've got to dry it, you just can't get it. And, uh, but the wood firing somehow brings back some of that vitality, some of that glow. So that's what you're trying to do, is actually try to recreate that moment where you, uh, where you get, like the, the big piece with the figures on it. That piece never looked better than when it was fresh. And I just finished it, and it, and it just had that glow of the, of the play. Uh, Steve, can you also talk about your glazing? About who? Your glazing. About my glazing? Um, <laughs> you know, from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, this, this is something I learned from Harry. I learned that uh, uh, it's important to work with a lot of different techniques. That if you have one technique and you have one product that you provide, that you don't have a dialogue going on between these different techniques. And you don't have a dialogue between these different themes. Like that, that piece with that fish, that's definitely a dialogue, and that piece is, is a direct, you know, descendant of that dialogue. Uh, so you, you, if you work with a lot of different techniques, also, you don't get burned out. Uh, you, you don't want to be coming in and having to make in that 10,000th month. You want to be coming in and can't wait to get your hands on that clay. And so for Harry, it was important to do one-of-a-kind pieces and do, do limited production. And I really uh, based the way I work on that philosophy. You know, one-of-a-kind, but then also limited production. And the limited production is so important. It is so important to sit there and throw a series of mugs or a series of bowls. That rhythm that you gain from that one bowl, and then another bowl. You, know, you open it up, and you start shaking it, and you cut it off. That rhythm is one, two, three. And eventually, uh, you come to a place where you're realizing that things are going well. <laughs> <laughs> and that you're, that you're in a rhythm. You're in a wonderful rhythm. And that is what the whole thing's all about. That's what work is all about. That's why we work so damn hard. It's for that moment. And it, you know, it's a sweet moment. It's worth it. And you can't get it any other way. <laughs> you have to have that, that dedication. And to a point of where the hands, they already, they know what they're doing. Uh, the mind's out of the way, and the hands know what they're doing. And that, that's when you know uh, that work is going well. And Harry knew that. He knew that that was, that was why he worked harder than anybody I had ever met. I always considered myself a hard worker. No. <laughs> uh, no, one, no one worked harder than he did. Where do you spend most of his time on these pieces? Um, like either throwing or turning or sculpting or blazing surface designs. What do you think he spent the most amount of time on? Or even gallery cells, that sort of thing. 
Um, I think he spent as much time as was needed in each uh, step of that process. Uh, yeah, he didn't cut corners. He didn't, yeah. He wouldn't try to figure out a way of not having to trim anymore. That would not be Harry. Uh, yeah, so he tried to do everything well. And everything had to have that integrity. Uh, I know for myself, when I'm finishing a piece, a piece of sculpture, and really getting those spherical shapes full and without irregularities, that there's Harry. <laughs> I know that's a Harry moment. Uh, he told me when he went to the uh, Art Students League and uh, he was studying scul sculpture and they were, their first exercise was to uh, sculpt, carve an egg. And they put that egg under a strong, strong light and if there's any irregularities, uh, they'd have to go back at it again. And he said that was the hardest thing he ever did. But once he got there and he could pull that off, once you got that in your in your DNA, then everything is, has that integrity. So I mean, that, and that, so for me, yeah, when I, I love uh, when I'm at that moment. I'm finishing the piece. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful moment. And it usually takes about half the time the whole piece takes. It's just that, that last step. You think it's going to just be five minutes? Yeah, it's like five hours. But you know, when, think, when work is going really well. It's five hours, yeah, they just fly by. You don't even, you don't even, uh, you don't even notice the clock. We notice. You know that? Oh, it's five o'clock, oh my god. Seems like it's coming home to get to to uh, to guess at your legacy but what would you say Harry's legacy would be uh, or will be 
Whose legacy? Harry. Harry. Oh, Harry's legacy? Well, I had just uh, written a piece for uh, a studio choir. Do you have a board? Are you on the board? Yeah. You know, the, the editor said that I should read, that thank you and remind people that the piece is coming out the next issue. I'm so excited. Can you Studio say that again? What, what is that? Studio Potter Journal. Yeah. And uh, so I wrote about uh, Harry and my friendship and his background. I felt that it was important for the, the overall community of Potters, the community of Potters, the, the national community of Potters, to know about Harry. We know him here recently, but the rest of the country doesn't know him. You know we don't go over the bridge much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I was hoping that this, this could be just a small uh, foundation stone for that. Wow, that's um, great. To get that story out, because it's an important story. Um, we really are part of a movement, uh, and it's so wonderful to be part of a tradition. Uh, and, and then you feel a responsibility to it as well. You try to do it as, as well as you can, and you try to communicate why this is special, this tradition that we're members of, uh, the, the different apprentices that have worked with Harry. When we talked, we almost talked in unison. It's amazing. We, we, his, Harry's template for who he was was, was, was very strong and, and, and rigid, and, and we all experienced it, and we bought it. You know, it's, it's fully part of us, and then we have, with, with our own personality, we have to uh, make a new from there. But that template is a part of all of us, and it's an incredibly important uh, legacy. I was, I was so happy. I know Harry was very happy that Matthew was being part of this, because that's the next generation. And, uh, and, and uh, Matthew took a lot of classes with Harry. Uh, and they, you know, they really enjoyed each other. Um, and I, that was one of the great values, valuable um, times that we were able to share with Harry to continue that legacy. You hope the legacy is, um, there's so many different, what this encompasses is so many different things. Uh, I mean, it encompasses, why is working with the hands important? Why is work important? Uh, why is the history of this uh, medium important? Um, why is, uh, how we interact with the clay and our environment. You know, what, what is there? And why art itself? It's, it's art itself. Why is art important? It, it's all right here. It's all encapsulated in this clay, uh, this spinning piece of clay. I'll do some paint. Just finish this up. Steve, how can we read that article you wrote? Is it available online? Uh, if you go to Potter.org, the branded website, a really good website. Um, that'll put you in touch with the magazine. I'm not sure whether it'll be published on the site, if you, whether you'll be able to see it on the site if you don't have a subscription, but that would at least lead you in the right direction. They have a library here, don't they? Yes. <laughs> so they can get it and have it available as well. Okay, so I'll do a little painting here. Um, these are um, these are wonderful brushes, Japanese brushes, um, Sumire brushes. Um, they hold the, the they hold their point beautifully. They're very responsive. They do take what you can do. What I'm painting with is colored clay. Uh, you can't paint with just regular paint. You have to paint with, with clay. Because clay sticks to clay, and then the, uh, the colors really integrate right into the form right away. So let's see. Maybe I'll do a hair down here. So that's one stroke. I'm going to do it with as few strokes as possible. Um, because it's important not to overwork me. That's the beginning of virus. Another little cheeky here. And 
And uh, I worked with five different colors. And I started out with light color and I worked with the darker tones. And uh, not so much now, but I know when uh, sometimes you're, you know, during the course of the day, you're all, you kind of worked up. As soon as I get that brush going, comes me laying down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they use different minerals for the uh, colors. Um, the brown is from iron, blue is from coal, stuff like that. Here's this is kind of fun to do the ranch. The ranch is really fun. And just with the wine, you know. It's kind of fun. Is that the same 
same kind of thing you used as your, for your beach grass? Yeah, this is beach grass. The colors will change when they fire, right? That's right, yeah, the colors change. But they're pretty similar, they're not too far off. Now we're the iris. We just have these blooming. I always make sure I, I, uh, I pick the irises and uh, paint them every year. Because I need that connection to real life. Uh, I always learn something new. And it's one of the things about being an artist is that you become super you become good at being aware. That's our, that's our skill. And then we find things that, when we become aware of, they become some of, of, like obsessions. I mean, groupies, so that's my obsession. Um, and, uh, and you want to, once you've uh, been so excited about this, this way you're exploring, you want to share with others. Like, artists are, are generous people. They want to share what they what they that they become aware of. But it's, this is a really big crush, but it's amazing how we can do such a delicate stroke. Stylization. I'm not trying. I'm trying to minimize uh, when I develop a theme. Just use as few strokes as possible to tell the story.